Sioux City's church. My name is Carlos, and I'm your friend. <laughs> Listen, what a privilege it is for me to be here with you this morning. If I'm the most huggable pastor, then uh, Pastor Kyle, you, you have to be the most quotable pastor. You're the most quotable pastor. Um, when I uh, give him phone calls, sometimes I'll be like, Dude, I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to communicate flexibility to our church. He's like, dude, healthy things grow and growing things change. I'm like, okay, that's really good. He's like, yeah, people need to have a mission in the world and a ministry in the church. And I'm like, dude, where are you coming up with these things? I'm like, where do you wanna go for dinner? He's like, dude, you can have steak, stew, or stromboli. Which one do you want, dude? I'm like, how does he do it? He is the master of alliteration, but seriously. Uh, no, um, just from the bottom of my heart, man, um, I love you. Really grateful for you and your family, Margie, you too. And uh, we wouldn't be here, uh, especially where we are now as a church, if it wasn't for you and your leadership. So thank you so much. Give it up for your pastor, man, Pastor God, come on. And not just for him, I, I wanna thank you. I want you to know this past year has been uh, incredible for us. We just celebrated two years um, about a month and a half ago. We moved into a 24-7 facility, uh, which is unbelievable. And part of the reason we were able to do that is because of your generosity. Um, earlier this year, we found out from a movie theater that we, we were gathering in that we weren't gonna be able to meet there in October. And we're like, what are we gonna do? Because real estate in a city like Miami is very difficult to come by. But the Lord opened up this opportunity. I remember sitting in New Orleans with Pastor Kyle, Pastor Dave, Pastor Caleb. I'm like, dude, we have this opportunity. I don't know if we should do it. And what if, and what about this? They're like, go for it. <laughs> And we did it, and it's been such an incredible blessing. And so I want to thank you uh, for giving uh, to a place that you haven't even been to. Some of you, some of you have actually been there, but most of you haven't. And I want you to know that your generosity is directly impacting our church. Your prayers are the lungs of the church, not only here, but also uh, in another part of the world. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to be in Acts chapter 19 this morning. Uh, you can turn there. Let me pray for us, and then um, we'll get going. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to be able to gather, reflect on your word, respond to your love. Thank you that we can walk into this place and be free because of what we just sang about the blood of Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord. I pray that you would open up our hearts wherever we might find ourselves today. Some of us who are joyful and walking with you, I pray that today you would multiply our joy. I pray for those who may be curious about the claims of Christ today that you would reveal yourself uh, to them, that you would meet us wherever we may be. If we're discouraged, Lord, would you please fill us up with your spirit today as we look at your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever wondered why so many Christians are bored with their faith? Christianity was not designed to be lived at anything less than 100%. It's sort of like when you commit yourself to a marriage relationship. It doesn't work unless you're fully committed. And it's the same with Christianity. It cannot just be your side thing. Otherwise, you will get bored or you will get really frustrated. In fact, when Jesus calls us to have a relationship with him, he calls us to come up and take our cross and walk with him. He's calling us to live in what a pastor from New York City calls the redemptive edge. I want to show you um, this graph that I found really useful in my life. He describes essentially people in Christianity or in the kingdom of God uh, across this span that when you come into the kingdom of God, you can kind of um, proceed with caution. There are some people who come to church and they're dipping their toes in and what's happening inside of their hearts and their minds is they're saying, you know what? You gotta be careful with this church thing. Let's not be too fanatical, okay? We're gonna go during Christmas and Easter, all right? Um, and maybe if they have like another special event for my kids. But then at some point along this continuum, you move from caution 
to comfortable Christianity. This is where, you know what? Okay, I'm going to go to church every weekend except on key critical football games during the season. And I want to make sure they have something for my kids that it's going to fit my schedule. This is the place where you're coming to church to consume rather than contribute. You want to make sure your pastor's funny. You have a really good kids ministry. You can drop off the kids. You have a youth group. Everything is settled and it works just for you. This is where a lot of American Christianity is with a church in the West and can be between caution and comfort. But then there's another point where you go from comfort to this area of concern. And this is where people start getting a little worried about you, your family and friends. They're like, dude, um, what do you mean you're gonna be at church three days this weekend for something called the weekender? What is that? What do you mean you have a, a, a prayer group during the week, a DNA group? What is that? You're giving to the church consistently out of the income that you work so hard for? This is where people start getting concerned. You ever been there? Where your family's like, dude, what are you doing? That's you, but then there's another level where the ministry of Jesus took place, and that was between criticism and darkness. Christianity lived and 100% is risky. It's adventurous Christianity. Jesus ate with sinners. He confronted traditions. He chose disciples that most likely you and me would not have chosen. At the same time, it says in the scriptures that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He was walking to push back darkness. He called you and me to be able to push back the darkness of this world through the power of the Spirit. Amen? So what do we see? We see him. This is what we see in the book of Acts. You've been in it. There is adventure after adventure walking by faith. You can frame it like this. You see people taking personal risks to bring Christ to every relationship, one person at a time. You see people taking risks to be able to not only proclaim the good news of Jesus, but to also display his good works. But what happens when you begin to take personal risks to bring Christ to every relationship? Well, let's look at the text. Acts chapter 19, starting in verse 23, this is what Luke the physician writes, look at this. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades, and he said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul, this dude, has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. What happens when you take personal risks to bring Christ to every relationship? I'll tell you one thing that takes place. When you take personal risks to bring Christ to every relationship, your idols and the idols of the context that you're ministering in will be exposed. When you live a kind of Christianity that requires faith and not sight, the idols inside of you and the idols around you will be exposed. And if you're here and you don't deal with your idols, at some point your idols will deal with you. This is how the Puritan John Owen puts it. He says, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. 
Today, listen, if you're here, you've, if you've grown up in church like I did, I grew up in Venezuela, okay? South America, came here when I was 13 years old. I grew up in the church. I heard about sin. I heard about idolatry. And at some point in my life, I did not take it seriously enough. You have to take your idols seriously or they will destroy your life. It's sort of like, imagine a young couple who just gets married and starts watching HGTV. And they start dreaming about the house that they're going to fix up that's gonna cost three times as much that they really originally thought. And they decide to move to a beautiful city called Winston-Salem, and they buy this historic fixer-upper. And they're just having an incredible time, and they're painting the rooms and selecting the furniture and fixing up the drywall. And it takes them three months, and finally, this dude's got to get to work. And he says, okay, honey, you know what? There's a small leak under the sink of the bathroom in the second floor, and I'm going to fix it next week. But what happens after next week? He didn't fix it, okay? Don't get triggered. Listen. It takes them, right? That, that week turns into a month. That month turns into a year. And what was a small, imperceptible leak at one point, now this little tiny leak becomes a hole in the second floor. <laughs> Why am I sharing the story with you? Because listen, if you don't deal with the leak, it has the capacity to bring down your house. It's the same with your idols. If you don't deal with them now, they're going to, they're going to deal with you later. So the question is then, how do we deal with them? Okay, number one, here's what we need to do. We need to anticipate resistance. We need to anticipate resistance. Anticipate resistance from the outside. Here's how important dealing with idolatry is. If you take a look in the scriptures, what's the first commandment? You could talk back to me. I'm not trying to trick you, okay? (laughs) You shall have no other gods before, don't be scared. <laughs> you shall have no other gods before me. Then in the New Testament, when Jesus, you know, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, this is of primary importance to God, and it should be of primary importance to us. In Acts chapter 19, here's what's taking place. Paul has been preaching the gospel in the city of Ephesus, one of the great cities of antiquity. And there's incredible works happening. Churches are being planted Disciples are being made. And in this particular narrative, if you look earlier, what you'll see is that there's some unusual miracles taking place. In fact, there's a moment where the scripture says that even the handkerchief of Paul is being taken to other people and that demons are coming out of people just by touching this handkerchief and they're being healed. Like one of my professors in seminary used to say, put that in your theological pipe and smoke it, okay? I, I, I'm like, dude, what do I do with that theology of the handkerchief? I don't know. But here's the point. There is a revival taking place because Paul has stepped out in faith as taking great personal risk to bring Christ to the people of the city of Ephesus. And you can be sure that when you begin to advance the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness, you're going, to, you're going to encounter resistance. And it's really interesting because in verse 23, Luke says that about that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. In other words, something outside of the ordinary was taking place. It's like the kingdom of darkness was mounting an assault against Christianity. And it was catalyzed by this man called Demetrius, a uh, a silversmith who recognizes, he says, you know, this dude Paul says that we can't build gods with our human hands. And I'm like, yes, you cannot build a God with human hands. He gets his buddies together and he says, dude, this dude is gonna affect the economy. He's gonna tear down the temple of Artemis and her uh, magnificence. And just to give you a, a, a picture of what this was like, of how big of a deal was Um, was taking place during that time. I want you to think back at last week. You were talking about Acts 17. And how many of you have been to Athens or seen a picture of Athens? Okay, not Georgia, Athens, uh, Greece, by the way. (laughs) Just (laughs) listen. (laughs) 
Uh, he, here's, it, this is really cool. If you've ever seen, if you've ever been to a Greek restaurant, you're going to see a picture of the Parthenon somewhere, okay? Uh, the uh, temple dedicated to, well, what's her name again? Did I forgot uh, the goddess's name? Um, Athena. Yeah, okay, great. Got it. Back. I'm almost 40 years old. This is what happens? Anyways, uh, so um, Athena, right? So if you stand anywhere in the city of Athens, you're going to behold her temple. You've seen it in pictures. It's like you can't miss the magnificence of this edifice. And as incredible and grand as the temple, as the Parthenon is, the temple of Artemis that was in Ephesus that is described here is four times the size of the Parthenon. Scholars tell us that if you were to walk into that temple, you would see 127 columns that rose up to 60 feet. Etched onto the stone, you would have seen the great works of sculptors, the Michelangelos of their time. People from all over Asia used to pay homage. They used to make a pilgrimage in order to visit this temple to worship the goddess Artemis. This was no small cult. Christianity was breaking down strongholds. And in this moment, what the gospel is attacking and confronting is the idol that the people had made in Artemis. See, whenever you take personal risk, whenever you preach the gospel, it's going to have consequences outside of an individual, amen? Because we believe that the gospel changes people and people change the world. What do you think is gonna happen? when you move into that new building in downtown and you begin preaching the gospel? What do you think is going to happen when you begin to take personal risks and you start talking to your friends about Jesus and they're like, yeah, cool, man, but how do you, how do you uh, feel about it? What's your position on sexuality? And, and what's your position on, on, on these different ethical matters that the scripture's very clear on? What do you think is gonna happen? People will be confronted with their idolatry and that has a way of inciting resistance and opposition. And if you and I are gonna be, if you and I are gonna be equipped to handle idolatry, we, have to, we cannot be surprised by this. We have to anticipate, we have to anticipate resistance. I, I, I remember this story, uh, a revival was taking place, I think it was in Scotland, where the farmers, okay, had to retrain their horses because the horses wouldn't respond to anything but cussing. <laughs> the move of God was so strong and they had to change the way they were speaking that it even affected the farming community for a couple of months. I want you to know, I believe that God can do immeasurably more than we think or imagine. He's, he's already doing a great work among you, amen? And I also believe that there's more for you and more for us, amen? Do you believe that? If you want to step into that, you're gonna to have to confront your idols. You're gonna to have to anticipate resistance. And that resistance doesn't only come from outside of you. You're gonna to have to anticipate the resistance that comes from within you. Those idols are not just out there in the culture. They're in the throne room of your hearts. How do you deal with your idols? You anticipate resistance from the outside, but you have to anticipate resistance from within. John, who walked with Jesus for over 10 years, the beloved disciple, he wrote 1 John. Do you know how he ends that letter? He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Anticipate resistance from within. Look at verse 28 in Acts 19. When they heard this, when they heard what the silversmith was talking about, they were enraged and were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus and Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples wouldn't let him. And even some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his, they sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Put yourself into that moment. Think about what's taking place. There is a riot. Look at verse 32. Now some cried out one thing and some another, for the assembly was 
in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, he wanted to make a defense to the crowd, but when they recognized that he was a Jew for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. How does the human heart respond when we are confronted with idols? Well, when you look at scripture, you're gonna see that when, we, when we're confronted with our idolatry, we'll either avoid it or we'll respond with anger. In avoidance, it looks something like this. Whenever somebody confronts you with their idolatry, it's kind of what Paul talks about in Romans chapter one. He says that human beings exchange the truth for a lie. When you're confronted with your idol, you know what you can choose? You can choose to numb your mind by binging on Netflix shows all day long. This happens sometimes when you're a college student and you're a freshman and you know what? Instead of thinking about the ultimate questions of life and what's my calling and purpose and what am I gonna do with this career? You just kind of avoid, you can, avo you can avoid the gospel altogether and you're, you know what? I'm just gonna go party. And then what happens when the second semester comes? Reality sets in and the lights have dimmed and the party's done and you lay your head in your pillow at night and you're like, dude, okay, I have to do something with my life. You've chosen to avoid your idols. Well, what happens when you're in the throes of raising kids and there's no comfort large enough, there's no house big enough that you can buy, there's no vacation grand enough that can satisfy the longing inside of you. There's, no, there's nothing that can provide the comfort that will soothe the turmoil that's going on inside of your soul because you've been avoiding this idol that's in your heart. You can choose to avoid or like happens, look at what happens in this text. When you're confronted with your idol, you can respond in anger. You can respond with anger. Picture what's taking place in this text. They, they, bring, they bring the disciples into this theater with the exception of Paul. Now, when you read theater in Acts chapter 19, it's not a room like this. I want you to think about the most epic amphitheater that's been carved out in a mountain because that's what they did back then, somehow. There's 24,000 people that fit inside of this theater. And it says in the text that there's confusion. They don't even know why they're there. They're just enraged. Haven't you felt that way sometimes when you're confronting idols, when you're preaching the gospel, people can just get angry. They don't even know why. There's no logic, no reason. You can't even have a conversation because something's going on inside of their hearts. You know the gospel is offensive, right? The gospel offends us because we're essentially confronted the sinfulness of the human heart. That's what happened here in this text. And so they're just responding in anger and in confusion. They are beginning to chant at the top of their lungs, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Why does the human heart respond in such irrational ways when confronted with our idols? Listen, you have to anticipate resistance from the outside. You have to anticipate resistance from within you, but you also have to know how idols work. You have to know how idols operate in your life. I wanna give you some, uh, some, a sketch of the dynamics of idolatry because in this case, it begins with a lie. See, idolatry begins with deception. This is as old as the Garden of Eden. In this case, what's the lie? The lie is there's a meteorite that came down, landed on Ephesus, and somebody decided this rock must be worshiped. That is the root of Artemis, of the Ephesians. It's a stone, an inanimate object that somebody projected some value onto this particular stone and they began to worship it. Somebody began to say, you know what? This is a, this is a goddess of fertility. If you want a family, if you want great intimacy in your life, if you want a great marriage, we must worship this rock. <laughs> Idolatry begins with a lie. Isn't that what happens in the Garden of Eden anyways? It begins with deception. Lies are so devious, they have the capacity to enslave our minds. If you're here, listen, and if, if, if part of what's going on inside of your mind, part of how the enemy is tempting you, if you're saying things like, hey, you know what, if I just met the right person, I'd be happy and fulfilled for all the rest of my life. Do not buy into that lie. 
it's, idols, they're so interesting. It's a good thing that has become an ultimate thing. It's a functional savior. Your spouse or your loved one cannot save you. They cannot save you out of your sadness. They cannot save you out of depression. They can't meet a particular longing. It is a beautiful thing to have a spouse, but they are not your saviors. Have you been deceived in this particular area? It's so common. Idolatry begins with a lie, but then that lie leads you to doubt. It leads you to doubt. And when I talk about doubt, I'm not saying just like idols will scream at you like atheism. No. (laughs) Sometimes I feel like when I meet with some of my friends, I'm like, dude, you know, oh, atheism, evolution. I'm like, guys, listen, it's a lot more deceptive than that. Okay. The lie turns into a doubt. Doubting the goodness of God first. Is God holding out on me? Does he have my best interest in mind? Do I actually really believe that he is who he says that he is and that he's going to do what he said he's going to do? You doubt the goodness of God, but then something else happens with idolatry. You begin to doubt the consequences of sin. Is this really that bad? You begin to doubt the consequences of sin. Just a couple of months ago, there's a publication in Miami called The New Times, and uh, they came out with a disheartening article that essentially Miami had the highest per capita content creators in a website called OnlyFans. Now, if you know anything about this particular website, you know that it's mainly used for pornography. So that means that for whatever reason, more people per capita in Miami create inappropriate pornographic sinful content that destroys minds, fuels human trafficking, breaks down marriages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Now listen, I want you to know I love my city. Whatever image you have of Miami, it's not like Miami Vice, okay? I don't want you to have that image. Um, It's incredible. God's doing an incredible work there. But this is one of our idols, the idol of sensuality, the idol of vanity. If you were to meet with one of these content creators who have been made in the image of God, you know what they probably say? Dude, our city is just really expensive, and I'm just trying to make a living. And I thought this wouldn't be that bad. That's what happens when you begin to doubt the consequences of sin. If you don't pay attention to that, what happens in your life, listen, is that that sin will begin to destroy you. You won't see the brokenness of it until it's too late. Deception turns into doubt, doubting the goodness of God and doubting the consequences of your sin. I want you to know if you are engaged right now, if you have a stronghold in your life, not just a struggle, a stronghold. I came today to remind you from the word of God that this is serious and that it has to be dealt with. That deception turns into doubt. That doubt leads to disobedience. It leads to you actually then sinning against God and that disobedience turns into disaster. There's a famous preacher by the name of Adrian Rogers who has this quote. He says, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. Here's a question for you. What is the lie that you've been believing that whether you want to or not will ultimately end up in disaster? What is that lie today? Think about your relationships. Think about your work. Think about your finances. Think about what you long for the most. What is the lie that you've been believing that if you're not careful enough, it will lead you down this path of destruction? What is it? In this particular text, we see how when you take personal risks, 
you will see the kingdom of darkness oppose you, right? You have to anticipate resistance from the outside. You have to anticipate resistance from within. You have to know how idolatry works. You gotta understand the dynamics of sin and um, idolatry. And then finally, number three, you have to decisively dethrone your idol. Decisively dethrone your idol. This is a decision that we can take this morning. We can do that today. If you are here and you are captivated for some reason by an idol inside of you, today is the day that Jesus wants to set you free by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to make a decision. It's interesting because this text doesn't give us a formula for dethroning our idols. Now, if you read the book of Acts, you will see different instances on how this happens. Essentially, the way that the text ends, there's a riot. People are chanting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. There is confusion because that's what idols create. And then <laughs> the city clerk comes out and essentially says, everybody just chill out for a moment, okay? Chill out. If you want to deal with these Christians, just take them to court. The courts are open because we don't want to get in trouble. Out of self-preservation, they stop the riot and Christians continue to preach the gospel through Asia Minor, okay? But the question then for you and for me is, how do we dethrone the idols of our heart? Well, there is another instance in the book of Acts where people respond in anger. In Acts chapter seven, the first martyr of the church, Stephen, he begins to proclaim the gospel to religious people. And it says in the text that when they heard this, they gnashed their teeth and they responded with violence. What do we learn from that text about dealing with your idols? Listen to this. If you wanna deal with your idol decisively today, you have to move from resistance to repentance. You have to move from resistance to repentance. Stephen says this in Acts chapter seven when he's preaching the gospel, he says something so interesting. I want you to hear what he says to the crowd. He says, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Did you know that you can resist the Holy Spirit of God? You are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Here's the question for you and for me today. Where are you resisting the Holy Spirit? Where today are you resisting the Holy Spirit of God who has told you so many times, who is reminding you even today as you look at this text, where are you resisting the Holy Spirit? For some of you, Jesus is inviting you into a relationship with him and he's been doing so and you can look at your life in different circumstances and see that he's been drawing you to himself. Are you resisting his offer of redemption? Today is a day where he wants to come and take over your life and be the Lord of your life so you can dethrone your idolatry and trust and experience him. For some of you, maybe you've been resisting the Holy Spirit in your family, in your relationships. Think about your children. Think about your ministry. Think about your vocation. Where are you resisting the Holy Spirit? What is the idol that is standing between you and God? What's the idol that's been keeping you from actually walking in the purpose that God has for you? Because listen, maybe what's standing before you and your one person is the idol that you're unwilling to deal with today. We wanna take personal risks to bring Christ to every relationship. But how can we do that if we're unwilling to deal with our idolatry? Have you made the decision to deal with your idol today? Maybe you'd say, Pastor Carlos, man, I, 
I want to. I want to. I've been trying to. I just can't seem to get rid of this thing. I can't shake this bad habit. If that's you, then I want you to know that you're in good company. You remind me of a story of a little hobbit named Frodo. You guys know who Frodo is? Anybody watch The Lord of the Rings in this place? I didn't know Pastor Caleb was a huge fan, by the way, of this book until last night when he corrected my illustration, okay? <laughs> if you haven't taken the time, okay, to watch the greatest trilogy of all time, we have a prayer team available to you. <laughs> Just take a little time, 17 hours of your weekend, and then you, you get through it. Extended editions only. So um, here's what happens. Frodo is a little hobbit, which are smaller creatures with hairy feet that live in the Shire. And because of the purity of his heart, he's been tasked to take this ring of power that represents evil, forged by the Dark Lord Sauron himself in the fires of Mount Doom. He has to take it back to where the ring was forged. And if you read the story or you have seen the book, then you know that it took so much he endures betrayal. He endures pain. I mean, this dude goes through everything around this country called Middle Earth in order to be able to take the ring back to the place where it was supposed to be destroyed. And guess what? Finally, he enters Mount Doom. And in that last moment where evil is supposed to be erased, vanquished forever. Do you know what Frodo does? He lets us down. This dude went through all of these different things in order to like kill evil. But at the end of the day, as soon as he approaches the fire, he's not able to take off his ring and actually throw it in the fire. It's a great illustration that reminds us that the power of idolatry and the power of sin cannot be defeated by the triumph of the will. But listen, it needs to be defeated by the triumph of grace. He needed somebody outside of himself, the creature called Gollum, to cut off his finger in order for evil to be destroyed. In an infinitely way more incredible way what happens is Jesus Christ knew that you and me have been cut off from the father because of our idolatry and because of our sin and he chose to be the one that bore our sins on that cross he he walked a life that you couldn't have walked and he died the death that you and I deserved in order to rise on that third day to give you and me the power to deal with our sin and to walk in freedom amen how many of you believe that you can say, <laughs> amen. You can say, if you don't believe that, we're in trouble today. So here's what we're gonna do. The band's gonna sing a couple of songs. And I wanna invite you to pray with me uh, this morning as we come to the Lord and deal with our idols. Father, we're coming before you, Lord. I pray that you would reveal to us now where we are resisting your Holy Spirit. In fact, if that's you, if there's an area of your life where you feel like, man, I've been resisting the Holy Spirit, and you can point to that right now. Why don't you just lift it and bring it before the Lord this morning and say, Father, I, I want to stop resisting your will and I want to surrender to yours. Holy Spirit, we're here. We, we declare together, we want to stop resisting your will and submit our will to yours. Would you help us to destroy the idols of our lives? so that we can walk in the ways that we're supposed to walk that you've called us to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Church, I wanna encourage you. In your booklet, there's gonna be some questions that you'll see on the screen. If you're looking for ways to resist your idols, there's gonna be a great tool that was handed out in your workbook. I wanna encourage you to take this time over the next two songs and let's respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that we can bring Christ to every relationship one person at a time. Amen.